honored to be able to introduce our next speaker, Stephanie Redfeather. Reverend Stephanie, Re Reverend Dr. Stephanie Redfeather is a divine feminine change agent and champion of empaths, an award-winning author of the international bestseller of the evolutionary empath and empath activation cards. Her passion is to help fellow sensitive souls break out of energetic jail and fully embrace their soul's evolution as co-creators of new earth consciousness. As a shamanic minister, workshop facilitator, and prolific creator of spiritual tools, Stephanie has helped thousands to connect with their sacred self and heal their human wounds. Stephanie is the founder and director of Blue Star Temple, and you can find the website for that at bluestartemple.org, an online resource of spiritual seekers to learn energetic skills, hone empathic abilities, access spiritual knowledge, and connect with cosmic consciousness. Her specialties include masculine feminine balance, establishing boundaries, energetic hygiene, shadow work, shamanic consciousness, embodiment, and celestial mysteries. And with that said, we are so honored to be able to welcome you, Stephanie, and I will pass it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Brandon. I appreciate you. And uh, so give me just a moment to get my screen shared because I have slides as well. And are you able to see the slides at this point? Just want to double check. <clears throat> yes, we're able to see them, Stephanie. Okay, fantastic. All right. So uh, I find it fascinating that um, that we both have the same background for our PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I had to laugh at that. I'm like, hey, I recognize those. So uh, I, I love the uh, synchronicity of that. So my focus is on the star Sirius. Um, I began my journey with Sirius a number of years ago. I, I study and practice in a Peruvian tradition of shamanism called the Pachacuti Mesa tradition. And just like so many indigenous traditions, they have a strong relationship with their star ancestors. Their creation myths often include the star relatives. And so during my apprenticeship, um, the, the presence of our star relatives and the connection between sacred mountains and various stars and um, all the mythology really lit something up inside of me. And it, it became very clear very quickly that Sirius is my home planet. And there are other um, stars and, and constellations that I that I also connect to, but, but Sirius is my uh, my strongest, um, well, lineage, I would say. And so I want to start, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to share about different, um, some of the more esoteric knowledge and mythology of how Sirius shows up in a couple of different ancient um, and indigenous traditions. But I find it can help just to, to anchor ourselves in the, in the physical. And so while this may be a little didactic, uh, I do want to share a little bit about Sirius A, B, and C, just to orient us to what the star is and some of its uh, qualities. And so Sirius is part of the Canis Major constellation. And the easiest way to find it in the sky is to locate Orion, which is which is pretty easy um, to locate. And then you just trace Orion's belt from right to left, and it essentially just points straight down to the star Sirius. And so um, Sirius is uh, the brightest star in the night sky, 23 times brighter than our sun. It is almost two and a half times our sun's mass and uh, about 1.8 times our sun's diameter. It is in terms of, you know, the, the vast distances in the, in the galaxy, it's only 8.7 light years from Earth. And so other than Alpha Centauri, it is the closest star that we can see with the naked eye. And the word Sirius itself comes from the Greek term that means searing or scorching. And that'll become more significant when we talk about um, the dog days uh, and, and how that's related to Sirius. So when you view Sirius, it's a very brilliant white light with a little tinge of blue. Now, if you're wondering where is Sirius in the sky right now, it is visible, but um, it is it's the, the best viewing, if you will. So you just walk outside at night and 
there's Sirius in the sky is roughly from December to February in the Northern Hemisphere. And I'll talk a little bit more about the cycle of Sirius when it's visible and, and when it's not. Sirius B is not visible to the naked eye. And so between 1834 and 1844, there's an astronomer named F. Bessel. And he found that Sirius had this kind of wavy irregularity in its motion through space and came to the conclusion that there was an invisible companion revolving around Sirius A in the period of about 50 years. Every 50 years, it would make an orbit. And so that is Sirius B. Sirius B is a white dwarf, which means it is extremely dense. And just to give you an idea of how dense, the surface of Sirius B is 300 times harder than a diamond, and its interior has the density 3,000 times that of a diamond. It also spins very quickly on its axis, about 23 times a minute. So this generates a huge magnetic field around Sirius B. Its mass is nearly equal to that of our sun, but its diameter is only 19,000 miles wide, and that's 40 to 50 times smaller than our sun. So it's an incredible density, 90 times more than that of our sun, while it's being 40 to 50 times smaller than our sun. And a cubic inch of Sirius B's material, cubic inch, just, you know, little bitty, little, barely more than a sugar cube, weighs about two and a half tons. <laughs> And so in their relationship, Sirius A and B form what is known as a binary star system because they orbit around each other. And they have a, um, an eccentric orbit that has a period of 49.98 years, so just shy of 50 years. And although Sirius B is totally invisible to our naked eye, we can see and measure, if you will, the effects of um, its incredible electromagnetic field because it affects the Milky Way, the solar system, planets, the Earth. And so due to these magnetic properties and the incredible density of Sirius B, in its orbit, when it gets close to Sirius A, there's this huge magnetic storm that is created and it causes the stars to exchange large amounts of highly charged particles. And these particles get injected into um, the, the galactic magnetic field of the Milky Way. Now, our Earth lies in this stream of energy from Sirius. So if you're familiar with the solar winds, right, in, in, in the galaxy, there are certain directions that electromagnetic magnetic fields run, the solar winds. And so we are downstream from these energies from Sirius. And so if you're curious, when, when was the last time that Sirius A and B were, were close to each other? It was in 9394. And this magnetic storm experience tends to increase in intensity about five years before they are at their closest um, pass to, uh, of each other and about five years afterwards. And so it'll be, um, yeah, I have to do math now, 20, 2044 roughly, um, before they are at their, their closest um, approach to one another. Sirius C, this is very controversial because depending on what source you consult, some will say it exists and some will say it doesn't. Now there is a tribe of people called the Dogon. Uh, they live in Mali, which is in West Africa. And in their mythology, they, they, Sirius plays a prominent role. And I'll talk more about them here in just a little bit. But they talked about the existence of a third star in the Sirius system. To them, there, there is no question. And they called it Emeya. In 1995, there's two French astronomers that published a result of a multi-year study that there was apparently a small red dwarf star in the Sirius system, which only had the mass of about 0.05 of Sirius B. So again, it is, it is still controversial um, in the scientific community whether or not Sirius C exists. So there's Sirius A, which we can see visibly in the sky. There's Sirius B that orbits around Sirius A in a 50-year uh, orbit cycle. And then there's Sirius C. 
So let me share about the dog days. Um, as I uh, shared in the beginning, Sirius is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, Canis meaning dog. So some people think, um, you know, maybe you've heard the, the story of, well, the, it's the dog days of summer. It's the hottest time. And this is when the dogs go, you know, under the porch and try to cool off. But it's, they're called the dog days for a different reason. And, and then sometimes it's also called the dog star because it follows Orion into the night sky. So when Orion first rises in the east, it comes up and then you'll see Sirius following it. The dog days were directly tied into the movements and timing of the star Sirius. And so the dog days are named for the sultriest periods of the summer in the Northern Hemisphere. And they were named a long time ago, thousands of years ago, by observers in countries that bordered the Mediterranean. Now, this period was reckoned to extend from about 20 days before to 20 days after the conjunction of Sirius and the sun, where they are at the same point in the sky. In ancient times, these dog days would have roughly corresponded to the summer solstice, right? Summer solstice being the, the highest point, and then 20 days before and 20 days afterwards. But due to a phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes, the days have fallen later and later in the year. So they don't match up in current modern times like they did when they were originally named. <clears throat> Sirius is visible about three quarters of the year. And so I want to just share the, the cycle of when Sirius is visible and when it spends time in the, in the underworld, if you will, or when it is not visible. As I shared, the best viewing is uh, usually December through February, depending on your latitude in the north. But let's just start with when Sirius appears in the sky, the beginning of its cycle. It rises as a morning star, which is another way of saying it rises uh, at the same time as the sun, in August. So depending on your latitude, it's going to be a different day. And in the next slide, I'll give you more specific information if you want to chart that, you know, write it down for yourself so that you can um, do ceremony or, or witness that event happening next August. So from August until late May, it made a trek through the sky, going from east to west, eventually setting in the west in late May. And then it's going to disappear from the horizon. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in more esoteric terms or spiritual terms, we talk about it going into the kind of mythical underworld, where it is no longer visible in the night sky. And it spends about 70 days in the underworld, again, depending on your latitude. And that 70-day cycle is very significant to the Egyptians, which I'll talk about in a minute when I get to the, the Egyptian part. <clears throat> and so depending on where your latitude is, this is a, a chart for the Northern Hemisphere of when Sirius will, will rise. It's called a, a heliacal rising of Sirius. And Helios is the Greek name for the sun. So that's where the term comes from. It's heliacal, meaning um, with the sun. So Sirius rises with the sun as a morning star in the east in August, depending on what your latitude is. And so I'm at uh, 39 degrees and change. And so I'm going to be able to see Sirius August 10th, August 11th. <clears throat> and there's just a, uh, this is a screenshot from um, last year, 2021, of what that looks like, of uh, just a, an orientation. You can see Betelgeuse and, and Rigel uh, annotated there in the constellation of Orion. You can see where Sirius is. <clears throat> and the further north you go, the further Sirius slides to the south, and the longer you have to wait to see Sirius in the sky. And so stars rise in general about four minutes earlier each day and climb approximately one degree higher with the passing days. So let's weave in Egypt and the significance of Sirius and especially the heliacal rising of Sirius. So the first sighting of Sirius in ancient times was associated with the rebirth of the Nile. So the Nile floods every year. And in ancient Egypt around 3000 BC, 
the star's return after its 70-day hiatus, 70-day period in the underworld, coincided with the flooding of the Nile. And of course, the Nile is the, the lifeblood of the Egyptian culture then, just like it still is now. <clears throat> and so this 70-day period was so significant that it became the length of their funerary rituals for the pharaohs, mimicking the 70 days that Sirius spent in the underworld, or what they called the duat. And the duat uh, is a term that they use to describe uh, the region through which their sun, ga, sun god Ra traveled. And so each night when the when the sun set, Ra was battling it out with Apophis, who was this uh, embodiment of the primordial chaos. And so the sun had to defeat this primordial chaos in the underworld every night in order to rise again in the morning and bring order back to the earth. And so this this symbolism and this mythology, this timing was very important to the Egyptians. So important that the heliacal rising of Sirius marked the start of the Egyptian calendar year, which is also known as the Sothic calendar. And Sothic is a term that derives from the Greek word Sothis. So you might have heard of Sothis, which is the Greek name for the goddess Sirius, the star Sirius, the, the goddess that represents the energy of Sirius. And, you know, if you if you study Egyptian mythology at all, you'll notice there's a lot of Greek names that got woven into things or, or current terms that we have are the, the Greek version versus the Egyptian version. The Egyptian name for the same goddess associated with Sirius is called Sopdet. And that's a picture of her in the slide. And she's very easy to recognize because she has the five pointed star on her head. So the Egyptian New Year was celebrated with a festival known as the coming of Sopdet. And so you can see how significant this was uh, for the Egyptian culture. Uh, and as I shared before, the current, you know, if you wanted to track this now, because of the precession of the equinoxes, which I'll talk about just a, a wee bit here in a minute, um, shifts the timing of things over hundreds and thousands of years. And so the current heliacal rising of Sirius no longer coincides with the flooding of the Nile, but the, the significance of it is still there in the, in the Egyptian culture. <clears throat> so you can think of Sirius as our spiritual sun. Sirius is associated with higher dimensional frequencies of conscious and it helps us to quicken and evolve our planet, right? Our, our consciousness as humanity to shift our physical vibration. And as we learn more about the nature of our galaxy and its magnetic fields, I spoke of this a few minutes ago, we know that streams of energy from stars travel in specific directions, either up or down the galactic arm in which they're embedded. And so, um, you know, these, these energies uh, travel along these paths of magnetic field lines. And so we are downstream from Sirius in the part of the galactic arm that our solar system resides in. Now, if you want to uh, make notes of very specific times during the year to do ceremony or connect more deeply with Sirius, from late June to the September equinox, the light codes from Sirius are amplified by Sirius being in the beams of the sun. So it's the, the proximity of Sirius and the sun that amplifies these light codes. So this is an especially powerful time to receive downloads and insights from Sirius and, and connect with the star. So, you know, part of that time, it's going to be difficult to actually visibly see in the sky because it's going to be during daylight. Um, but you can, in, depending on where you live on the planet, you may not see it at all, but it, it doesn't matter. You can still connect with the energies and the frequencies of Sirius. And if you, if you think about it, if you kind of extrapolate, you know, in many spiritual traditions, we think of God as the bringer of life or the bringer of energy and light. Yet in its own way, our sun can take that title as well because it brings light, right? Life on earth would not be possible without our sun and the electromagnetic energy that we are bathed in. 
And we can also extend that title to Sirius as our spiritual son, because Sirius fits this description as well, transmitting its energy, highly charged particles, beneficial particles to our entire system via these magnetic field lines. So we literally receive energy from Sirius. So now it starts to get even more cool that it has been discovered recently that the star Sirius resonates harmonically with our sun, right? Our star, sun, and Sirius are resonant sisters. And so through studying the frequency of our sun, the frequency of Sirius, it's been determined that they are harmonic. And so just to give you an example of two objects being in harmonic resonance, Think of somebody playing a violin on one side of a room, and on the other side of the room is a piano that nobody is playing. And if you watch the piano strings, when certain notes are played on the violin, those same notes, those the, the individual strings which represent that note, will start to uh, vibrate on the piano with nobody playing it. So there, there's a, a harmonic resonance. So it is, you know, from a, from a spiritual and energetic standpoint, it is incredible to think about the fact that Sirius and our sun are connected in this way. They are intrinsically linked. So we're starting to get now more into uh, more of the esoteric knowledge uh, around the magic and mysteries of Sirius. And I want to share with you about the magical seal of Sirius. Sirius is considered to be a fixed star, also called Bahinian fixed star. And the term um, Bahinian, uh, it comes from, uh, it's an Arabic term or derives from an Arabic term called Bahman or root. And so what does it mean to be a fixed star? Um, so just a, a, a short definition. Um, fixed stars are, they seem to stand motionless, right? So, so, so they're not perfectly still. They don't stay in the same spot. They, they move because we move through space, right? But if you, if you look at the plane of our solar system, you can just think of it as a flat plate. It's not exactly, but just for simplicity, think of a flat plate, right? So so all of our planets are orbiting just in that particular kind of slice, if you will. And so because they're, they're, or they're always moving, they're orbiting, they're close by, they seem to move a lot faster than things that are farther away, but they also only exist in a particular slice of the sky. Whereas these fixed stars can be distributed anywhere throughout the entire celestial sphere. These Bahinian fixed stars are a selection of 15 stars that are considered especially useful for magical applications. And this derives from medieval astrology of Europe and the Arab world. And so uh, each was considered a source of astrological power. So these Bahinian stars were considered a source or a root, that's where the, the term comes from, of astrological power that was magnified whenever one or more of the visible planets were within six degrees of Sirius. And so if this is meaningful to you, if you like to track the, the planets, if you're an astrologer, you know, figure out where Sirius is and whenever other planets are within six degrees. And, you know, it's a, a potent time for, for ceremony, um, ritual, visualizing. If you're wondering what the, the funky symbol is there, every one of these fixed stars was assigned a Kabbalistic symbol. And so this is something you can actually look up online and they're, they're pretty cool. The, the symbols are, are very neat uh, just to behold, like you can feel the magic and the, the potency that's encoded just by looking at them. This is actually a painting um, in my Oracle deck called Empath Activation Cards. Uh, I brought in the energy of several stars, and Sirius was one of them. And so this is um, the oracle card of Sirius from my deck. <clears throat> so the ancient alchemists 
operated from the awareness that under certain celestial influences, magic was more likely to occur, especially when worked with consciously. Uh, and so this is uh, just, I want to place that in your consciousness so that if you, if that symbol is meaningful to you, if, if tracking the movements of Sirius is meaningful to you, you can weave these things into your um, spiritual ceremonies, your, your um, meditations, journaling, astral traveling, uh, and, and kind of amplify um, your experience with that. In addition, each Bohemian star also has a corresponding herb and crystals so that you can draw upon the star's influence. You can actually hold something, work with things, um, you know, create talismans, elixirs, sigils. Um, and so associated with Sirius, the, the herb is juniper and the, um, the crystal is beryl. And beryl has several different forms, more common ones you might be familiar with are aquamarine and emerald. So those are the more classical associations, but more modern associations with Sirius also include Super 7, which I have a, a specimen of, iridescent fluorite, which it's kind of hard to see, like you really need a good light to see the iridescence. Uh, and Sintamani, and I, I don't have a, a specimen of that, but those are um, more recent um, crystals that represent the energy of Sirius. And so now I want to talk about the Dogon tribe just a little bit more. <clears throat> and so the Dogons, as I shared, are from Mali in Africa. There's a map so you can get a feel for where they're from. And it is said that their culture traces their roots back to ancient Egypt. And this tribe was discovered in 1935 by a couple of French anthropologists who learned the language and gained the trust of the tribal shamans and priests and began to study their mythologies and origin stories. And so Dogon mythology says that their gods, the Nomos, came from Sirius B. Now their history traces back thousands of years. So isn't it fascinating, right? I mean, people could see Sirius in the night sky, but it wasn't until the 1800s that, you know, astronomers and scientists started mapping, right? Like knowing that that's a particular star and here's its orbit and here are some of the, the qualities and characteristics of it. So isn't it fascinating that this culture knew of Sirius thousands of years before, you know, modern science did? Dogon mythology states that the creator god of the universe, Ama, sent the Nomos, who are known to be amphibious water creatures. And so the, the translation, uh, they're collectively called the masters of the water. They can also be called the instructors or the monitors. And the, the top diagram there that looks like a fish, this is an indigenous rendering of the Nomos. Now they are said to have landed on earth in a spinning arc which is a depiction, uh, the, the bottom there uh, is a depiction of a Dogon drawing. So the Nomos came from Sirius B and the Dogon name for Sirius B is Patolo. Now getting into even more esoteric knowledge by the Dogon tribe, you know, so, so Sirius A and B rotate around each other, but it's not just in a two-dimensional plane, right? They're traveling through space. So there's this sort of um, helix shape that if you were able to trace uh, their orbits, you would trace this cycle through space. And the Dogons knew this helix style trajectory. They knew that Sirius B had an orbit of 50 years. They knew the shape of the orbit, and they knew that it was a very dense white dwarf. Once again, how could such an, this is the stuff that just fascinates me, and I love watching documentaries because I'm like, how did they know this? You know, the traditional um, archaeology and, and other disciplines of science would have us believe that we are as evolved and intelligent as we have ever been, and I absolutely don't believe that. <laughs> so, so here's um, a, a very basic rendering of all of the orbits. So we've got Sirius A, the blue circle there. Sigitolo is what the Dogon called Sirius A. Sirius B, Potolo, is the long elliptical orbit around the outside. 
Sirius C is kind of the, the orange, little orange ellipse around the blue dot, Emeya Tolo. And they even said that Emeya, that Sirius C, has a planet. So that little black circle around it with the black dot is, is what Dogon mythology describes as um, the, the planet that orbits around Sirius C. And in addition, their mythology describes the, the orbits of other planets around the sun, and they recognize the sun and Sirius as brothers or sister systems. Fabulous. So I want to very briefly introduce the concept of the precession of equinoxes because it, it's going to help uh, kind of give a, a context and foundation for uh, some other information I want to share with you about the relationship between Sirius and our sun. So the precession of the equinoxes basically describes the observable phenomenon, right? We can see this with our eyes and track it. The, the observable phenomenon of constellations moving backwards through the sky over thousands of years, right? So you can't tell it like, you know, go look at the sky to tonight and then go look at it tomorrow night. This is something that takes many thousands of years to be able to notice. So pre-session means pre-before, which is why it looks backwards, going, you know, not forwards, but backwards. How do we determine this? So let's say on the spring equinox, no matter where you are on earth, you faced east just before sunrise, and there would be a constellation right there on the horizon. Excuse me, that is the age that describes the age that we are currently in. Now, if you stood on that point every year, right, on the spring equinox facing east, sunrise, what constellation is there? If you did that for 24,000 years every day, it would trace through all 12 of the constellations and eventually come around to where it was before. So that is the very short definition of what the precession of the equinoxes means. What is not agreed upon is why. Why do they move, right? We know that we orbit around the sun. We know that, you know, everything in space moves. And so the, the most common or most popular theory is a theory called loony solar, right? So loony for lunar, solar, you know, so sun, moon, that suggests the earth has a wobble, like when you spin a top. And so this spin is what accounts for why we see these, um, the constellations moving backwards in time. There's another theory, and this is a theory proposed by Walter Cruttenden, who suggests that our sun, and, and that's the entire solar system, right? Because everything's rotating around the sun. And so that whole solar system is moving through space. And that this is what accounts for the change in positions of the constellations. And so according to Walter Cruttenden and other people who have the same theory, our sun and Sirius are in a binary relationship as sister suns, and they orbit around each other in a grand cycle of 24,000 years. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the great year, this is the great year. Now, there are other sources that say it's 26,000 years. There's reasons for the discrepancy. Some say 24, some say 26, but it's the great year is a, a grand cycle of time that has been documented by over 30 ancient civilizations, right? And corresponds to the rise and fall and rise and fall again of human civilization and consciousness. So if you look at this diagram, you can see the little pink dots or red dots on the on the far edges of their orbits. And so this corresponds to the darkest ages, right? So if you if you look at the Greek ages, iron, bronze, silver, and gold, if you look at the Indian Yuga cycles, which align precisely, right? The the period of lowest consciousness, the period of greatest ignorance is described as being when Sirius and the sun are as far away as they can possibly be. As they cycle closer in their orbits, then we start moving towards higher consciousness, more enlightenment and getting to the golden age. Again, this is a theory, but man, I'll tell you this stuff lights me up. 
So I want to uh, cycle back to Egypt and specifically bring in Akhenaten. Uh, Akhenaten is very meaningful to me. Um, I, I have Akhenaten as well as his wife Nefertiti. Um, this is something that I bought in Egypt. Um, very prominent in my temple space. In 1353 BC, Akhenaten became pharaoh. And it was uh, a very important focus for him to to get his people to to orient and concentrate on the Aten, which is the central, you know, their their term for the central focal point of all creation, God, essentially. And so the word Aten in ancient Egyptian means circle or disc. Uh, later, it meant came, came to mean sun disc. And Akhenaten has the name Aten in it. So his name means beneficial to the Aten. His given name was Aminatep IV, but he changed it uh, after he, he became pharaoh and went through a very dramatic spiritual transformation. So his reign is known as the Amarna period because he moved the capital of Egypt from the traditional site, which was in Thebes, uh, which uh, to, to um, Akhetaten, which became known as Amarna. And so the Amarna period is actually very controversial. Uh, it has been studied, debated, written about um, at that time in Egypt. The priesthood had created what you might call job security. You know, this has happened in a lot of um, religions and, and spiritual traditions by inserting themselves between the people and the spiritual godhead, right? Basically saying that, that you cannot have a direct uh, relationship with creator. We have to come in as an in uh, intermediary to communicate on behalf of all of the people. So of course, Akhenaten was saying, hey, this is, this is your God, you know, this is as represented by the sun. You have the right to be in direct communication with your God. You know, you are part of the sun. The sun grows you. And so Akhenaten and his, his queen, his wife, Nefertiti, were trying to maintain a very high level of consciousness in their society. Now, Akhenaten didn't forbid people from worshiping other gods, but invited them to, to kind of focus on this central concept of God. And so he was eliminating the need for an intermediary, which of course did not sit well with the established priesthood. And so there's very little remaining of the incredibly beautiful temples and other structures that were built during this Amarna period because the priests and subsequent rulers were like, hey, this guy pissed us off. So we're just gonna, you know, rub his rub his face out <laughs> on all of these stone sculptures. We're gonna knock down everything that he created. And so it's it's challenging to get um, information, uh, accurate information about this period of time because he was so controversial. Now, according to Sonia Grace, uh, who is a, a medium, if you will. Both Akhenaten and Nefertiti were from Sirius A. <laughs> and I just so love this. You know, when I when I think about how it all lights me up and how it's all connected, it just tells me that there's there's something to this, even if we don't have physical proof of all of it yet. So in Sonia's travel to Egypt and her, her astral traveling to Egypt, um, she connected um, with Ra, and was shown that in Akhenaten's time, the queen's chamber in the Great Pyramid was a portal to Sirius, and that this was how Akhenaten and Nefertiti transported themselves to and from their home system. And so I want you to take a minute to just really look at this image. It's a common image that is often seen. That's Akhenaten on the left, Nefertiti on the right, and their children. They are always shown with these elongated um, you know, hats, if you will, or crowns, however you want to describe them. Their children have elongated skulls. On the left is a photo of a statue of Akhenaten that is in the Cairo um, Museum in Egypt. And it is there, it, he is said to have been 13 feet tall and that he, you know, because all the pharaohs wanted to look whatever, masculine, manly, like there was a certain expectation of what the pharaohs were supposed to look like. He wanted statues of him to be accurate. And so you'll notice he has a very different body style, larger hips, very tall. I actually, when I was at the Cairo Museum, stood next to, next to the statue, held it, touched it, put my, put my body on it, and had such an incredible experience um, when that happened. 
Hey, so, Stephanie, sorry yeah. not to interrupt, just letting you know we'll get close to wrapping up in the next little minute and we'll yes. be passing it over to Joan at about 50 minutes past. So. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I was just noticing that. So um, so I, I wanted to create an opportunity because um, I wasn't, at, at, oops, sorry, as things were, um, as the timing was sort of unfolding, I wasn't sure if I would have enough time to fit everything in or would have to sh shorten since we started a little bit late. So I'm going to explain this to you and let you do it on your own. But the, the activity of star bathing, which basically means consciously getting in the presence of the stars, right? Going outside if you can, or being near a window where you can at least see them. And I invite you to connect with Sirius, um, bring Sirius into your meditations and into your astral traveling, into your ceremonies and, and see what happens. Um, so we're coming to the end of the, the presentation, and I just wanted to share with you uh, my two books, The Evolutionary Empath, which is an award-winning international best-selling book, and Empath Activation Cards, uh, which also won an award for a piece of art as well as the deck itself. If you want a signed copy with a personalized inscription, you can order those at my website, which is bluestartemple.org. And so I just want to leave you with um, a lovely little poem that just moves me every time that I say it out loud. We have calcium in our bones, iron in our veins, carbon in our souls, and nitrogen in our brains. 93% stardust with souls made of flames. We are all just stars that have people names. So thank you so much for this opportunity. It was so fantastic to share this information, and I hope um, that you were inspired by it. Mm, very Stephanie, beautiful. that was beautiful. beautiful. That was beautiful. Yeah. I love your cards. Mm -hmm. And you know, this morning at about quarter to seven, I went outside and I saw Sirius. You know, I have one of those star maps things. Yeah. I mm. wish, and so tomorrow I'm going to follow exactly. I'm going to bathe under Sirius. Mm. Okay. So Stephanie, if we are um, rising on the equator at the equinox, I mean, is what what age are we in according to that um, understanding? Right. So so this is where it's tricky because if you use the spring equinox, right, we are in the age of Aquarius. But if you use the fall equinox as your marker, we're in the age of Leo. Right. So there's there's always these opposites to, to keep in mind that, you know, if we are in the age of Aquarius, we also have to look at the influence of its opposite as well. I thought um, if we're in the sign of Aries, Aries is usually rising. Uh, right. Because the equinox would be the spring equinox is Aries zero degrees. Wouldn't that be rising on the at sunrise? There, there's, yeah, it's kind of too complicated to answer. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'm sure, I'm sure you know what you're talking about. We'll, yeah. we'll do a whole private course. One more thing: is the our sun in a binary system with Sirius, or because it already has two other stars with, so it'd be a four star system. We had Sirius A, B, and C. Well. Where um, but everything else, I mean, it's oriented around Sirius A, right? So B yeah. and C are, are okay. orbits around that. So wherever Sirius A goes, the others are going with them. And so right. it's, so well, it's more know, like planetary. Same, right, yeah. exactly. Because all the planets are going around the sun. So if the sun mm -hmm. and Sirius, everything that's orbiting around them all, you know. So the sun and Sirius are doing like a dance revolving around each other. Is that it? Yes, that is the theory. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. that's interesting. Okay, yeah. so we're definitely connected to Sirius somehow. Yeah. Thank it, you. It, it was fascinating um, just listening to it. You know, for me, just being kind of like a sci-fi geek, I'm just like, this is like real life Stargate the movie that, that we're talking about right here. It's like, I was, I, they must have kind of like connected some dots and and that's the thing, right? Like I, I, I'm fascinated by what Stephanie has brought into the conference because it's really being able to kind of look to our history and being able to identify the idea that, you know, star beings have been here all along. And, and, and I think if you were to go much deeper into right. that, you would realize that they are all throughout our history. So that was, that was really fascinating. It's got me thinking, uh, you know, what else is there that, that we still haven't learned about just yet, but yeah, you know, exactly. maybe we do know about it. We just haven't thought about it from that perspective. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Stephanie, yeah, where are you based? Where are you based out of which part of the world? I'm in Kansas city, Missouri. All right. Well, I'm glad there's some light going on there in Kansas city. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> thank you. Thanks for you. That Very was well great. Done, What's Stephanie. That? I, I'm so oh, thank you. Know. you thank you. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? That's a great like prerequisite for understanding Egypt, really. Well, that's what I was thinking as I was watching, looking at some of those slides of yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we should do a whole Egyptian day before we go to Egypt and talk to Stephanie. Yeah. Thank yes. you, Stephanie. Appreciate you. And yeah, I got your email about quantum timeline jumping. You are in that event, so okay. we'll let everybody. So yeah. Stephanie's going to be at our quantum timeline jumping conference in December. And we also have a workshop that we did on portal ascension with you too. And I just appreciate you so much, Stephanie. Thank you for everything that you share. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for all you do. Blessings, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for being here. After three years of having to produce the portal to ascension conference online, we have been waiting for this moment. The portal to ascension conference is returning live and in person. Join us at the Marina Village in San Diego, California, April 21st to 23rd, 2023. As massive shifts are happening on the planet and hidden truths are being uncovered, we are piecing together the fragmented parts of our existence and timeline. At Portal to Ascension, we are dedicated to full circle awareness of the truth of who we are and remembrance of our connection to the cosmos. This is showtime. There is no holding back. Now is the time for us to harmonize the frequencies and create unity and peace on Earth. We are deprogramming from an outdated matrix system, re-educating and remembering an inherent truth that connects us all. As we come together, we activate our truest potentials, individual gifts, and collective resolve. We are ushering a whole new reality that we know is possible and is waiting for us to embrace it. Join founder Neil Gore and the entire Portal to Ascension team with hosts Alan Steinfeld, Michelle Anderson, and Joan of Angels over these three days, April 21st to 23rd, 2023. We will experience musical performances by Larissa Stowe and the Shakti Tribe, Vox Angelus, Share the Light, Admiral Apollo, and Torquemji. This conference features incredible luminaries such as JJ and Desiree Hurtak, Adam Apollo, Carolyn Corey, Robert Schock, Linda Moulton Howe, Robert Edward Grant, Barbara Lamb, and many more. Register now at ascensionconference.com. It is time for humanity to awaken.